Hi all, we're just going to wait another minute or so because we see people um, joining fast and furiously here. Be right back. <clears throat> Hello, so uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everyone, depending on where you're joining from in the world. Uh, this is a webinar for the Research Data Alliance's COVID-19 Working Group. My name is Natalie Harrower. I am one of the co-chairs of the Working Group. And I just might ask people to mute their microphones if they've got them on, getting a bit of feedback. So we will um, kick this off now. Welcome to the webinar. Just to give you an overview of what we're going to speak to in, uh, in this webinar, we'll give highlights of the recommendations and guidelines as they currently stand. So the latest release went out on the 28th of May. Uh, we'll talk through very briefly the remaining steps that will take us to the final publication of the recommendations and guidelines. Uh, we'll address the plan for dissemination and outreach and welcome um, uh, input and uh, welcome Kind of assistance with that um, and also you can ask questions uh, we'll leave the questions till the end and then you can use the q a function if you look at your little control panel there you'll see a section that says questions and you just have to click on that to enter them there okay um, so very briefly what are or what were in a sense because we're coming towards the end here the objectives of the working group um, first, to clearly define detailed guidelines on data sharing under the circumstances that we're dealing with with COVID-19 and to help stakeholders follow best practices to both maximize the efficiency of their work, um, but also to act as a blueprint for future emergencies. Um, there's kind of two parts to this. One is to develop recommendations for policymakers to maximize the timely and quality sharing of data um, and also the, to feed into appropriate responses in such health emergencies. Um, but then at a more granular level to address the interests of researchers, um, policymakers, funders, publishers, um, and providers of data sharing infrastructures. So we've broken it down into recommendations, which are kind of higher level and guidelines, which are more concrete. So if you take a look at this um, diagram, this gives a, a sense of the shape of the working group, which has many parts to it, and these parts have contributed to this final document. Um, so it starts with a kind of uh, overarching recommendations, and then we get contributions from each of the research areas. And this is the order that you'll hear from today in the webinar, updates on their sections. So clinical, omics, epidemiology, and social sciences. And then we also have four cross-cutting themes uh, and uh, you'll also hear from them today so community participation for data sharing indigenous data legal and ethical considerations and research software and data sharing all under COVID-19 so that is the shape and the order of the document the way that it starts out is with an executive summary that's meant to give um, people an overview of what's included and if that's the only thing they can read it can point to some of the highlights uh, and then it moves into a statement of the objectives and uses of the document, which essentially goes through what I just mentioned before in terms of what the objectives are that we set out to, um, to define. Uh, and then it moves into a section called foundational recommendations. And what this section is about is drawing out issues, uh, challenges, and kind of responses, potential responses to those challenges that cut across all of the different areas that are discussed in the document. 
um, and really it positions the question as a kind of um, the critical need for timely data sharing on the one hand versus an overall lack of coordinated standards for doing this. So how do we address this particular, uh, the, the nexus of this challenge? And then there are um, eight different topics that, um, that again, were, were brought together from what the different research areas and overarching um, cross-cutting themes in the, in the document had worked on. Uh, so one is a, a call really for for open science, but in a coordinated way that cuts across jurisdictions and efforts to foster that. And I'd say most of the other foundational recommendations in some way are related to that. So that includes an, uh, an infrastructure investment um, in a kind of strategic and targeted way, um, the use of fair data and um, producing data that is fair in a timely fashion is very key. And um, um, all of the different sections speak to this. Uh, planning for data management at the earliest stages as part of that process, uh, the use of domain specific and rich metadata and also documentation of your processes and um, the work that you do and what goes into the data preparation, the use of trustworthy data repositories uh, for sharing that data, making it available, um, preserving the parts that are necessary for the long term. And then there's also a section on um, the way that publications should be uh, dealt with and um, kind of putting forward or prioritizing the publication of data under these circumstances. So those are um, overarching themes that come out of what the different groups have worked on and we, we put those first. Um, so they're meant to be taken on their own but also considered in relation to what you see in the rest of the document. So now I will move on to the different groups that will speak to um, what you will find in their sections. So we start with clinical. I'd like to introduce Da Wei to speak to this slide. Okay, thanks Natalie. Uh, my name is Da Wei Lin. Uh, I'm from uh, NIAID NIH in the US. Uh, I'm one of the uh, co-moderators of the clinical group. And I, I will present, uh, represent my co-chair, uh, fellow co-moderators and, and around uh, 80 uh, working group members. And so the, um, in our uh, group, uh, the challenges we're facing uh, that during the dynamics are many. Um, we are, we're under tremendous uh, time pressure. The studies and clinical trials uh, have known weaknesses such as the clinical trial does not have a control group. And, uh, and that the pre uh, pre preliminary results published with no or and not sufficient reviews, and uh, many places are repeating the same mistakes. Uh, and yet, we uh, we rely on the results of those uh, clinical efforts to make life and death decisions and uh, and then policies uh, to impact our livelihood. So, um, so that's kind of the um, the motivation for us to sharing data, uh, which will help uh, improve designs. Uh, allow scrutinize the results and conclusions and reduce the redundancies or use the redundancies to uh, in increase the power of, of data analysis. Mm -hmm. And so under uh, that circumstances and our uh, recommendations and guidelines are uh, following the two uh, principles, like there's two uh, bullets out there. Uh, one is that uh, although we want to timely uh, share data, but we don't want to cut corners in protecting privacy and, and confidentiality. And also, the um, we want to leverage the existing solutions. Uh, if it's out there, there's, if there's recommendations, uh, guidelines already out there, we want to adapt them uh, into the uh, pandemic setting. Uh, and also, we want to leverage the, um, the trustworthy resources uh, that um, to help the, uh, uh, the, the data sharing. Uh, and then the, in our detailed uh, recommendation and guidelines, and uh, they, uh, they point, at, point out at the bottom of the slide, uh, uh, we want to encourage to use uh, trustworthy sources of clinical data. And uh, there are some uh, certifications, for example, for data repositories. 
Uh, that's not should not be the only uh, limitation for trustworthiness. Uh, we can also rely on the, um, the, the the guidelines, criteria, best practices, uh, or principles uh, like the uh, the reason published the trust principles for data repositories. And those are the the community effort to ensure the trustworthiness. And uh, if uh, there is uh, the standards out there uh, we want to follow. Um, and then the uh, the third one, the clinical trials, uh, is uh, we have some recommendation and guideline for that as well. It's not about data, uh, but for clinical group, uh, the clinical trials are intimately related to like how you're going to share data, what kind of data you're going to um, uh, to generate it. So the, we have some recommendation for that, and then the uh, the last but not least is that we uh, include some uh, data types specifically for uh, the COVID nineteen, like uh, for example the the immunology and the imaging uh, uh, data are, are important, and also there is some uh, uh, healthcare data are relevant, uh, and then uh, for uh, a lot of of these data types is doesn't have a lot of uh, standard develop so um, so we incorporate some the practices that uh, that is currently used by the, uh, the uh, by those communities so that is our um, our work and now we we received the feedbacks for the last couple of days uh, I think there there is uh, mainly to clarify what we wrote there uh, and to to make it more specific uh, for the recommendations, but also I think the um, I think the one point I point out is that the there is uh, suggestions that we should probably include the preclinical data, and that's the things that we are uh, going to work on. So that's a quick summary. Great, thanks very much, Tawei. And uh, next we have the omics, and I believe we have Natalie to give the presentation. Hi, Actually, thank you, Natalie. Uh, Here's Rob. Yeah, oh, thank okay. you. We, 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 we were just discussing uh, among our, each other. Um, so okay. thank you very much. Uh, we, um, uh, uh, Natalie has been working all through the night, so uh, she asked me to, uh, to do uh, this. I am in Europe and it's a little bit easier. Um, the uh, Omics group, again, uh, only two co-moderators, but uh, we are insignificant uh, uh, relative to the whole group that has been co collaborating to get uh, all the information together. Um, uh, our uh, part contains some generic uh, uh, recommendations, uh, of course, uh, the same shape as any other uh, of the sections. Um, as is indicated here on the left in the slide. Um, I'd just like to uh, uh, give you an example of uh, what we have in there. And so the, the, our guidelines are focused on five uh, different kinds of uh, data. Um, so we have information about the virus genomics, about host genomics, about structural data, metabolomics and lipidomics. And we try to make all of those very concrete for researchers. Um, uh, an example is given in the in the right column for the structural data, where you see that we have sections on repositories, both for submission and for finding information. Uh, uh, if you are doing research that is based on existing data, um, uh, and on data and metadata standards, and the same is true for all the five uh, types of guidelines that that we have. Um, we try to uh, to make it as easy as possible by uh, uh, providing guidelines on how to choose between all those resources. And many of the uh, guidelines actually contain uh, sub uh, IDs for each of the, uh, the, the the types of structural data, for instance, that are there. Um, and that's the same is true for the genomics data. There are many different techniques, uh, each uh, had resulting in virus genomics data uh, are uh, uh, delivering data for different kinds of uh, repositories. 
Um, of course, there are many interactions and pointers towards uh, our other chapters uh, from our chapter. Uh, one thing that we've done uh, as much as possible as well is not only point uh, directly to uh, the publications that uh, that publish the, uh, the the statutes of the repositories and the standards and metadata, uh, standards, but uh, also to descriptions of those standards and their relations in the RDA fair sharing resource. Um, I think that's uh, that's it. I'm happy uh, at the end of the meeting to take your questions for Onyx as well. Thanks very much, Rob. Okay, then we'll move on to epidemiology and we have Claire to present this. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so epidemiology, first of all, I, I want to uh, thank uh, from the bottom of my heart, really the tireless efforts uh, on behalf of the uh, epidemiology subwork group uh, to generate a meaningful and useful and uh, actionable uh, document. Um, epidemiology, uh, it, it's been a challenge. Uh, uh, to uh, rein things in because uh, epidemiology uh, covers really a very wide range of uh, different types of data and sources, um, and yet it uh, underpins uh, really all of the, the strategies uh, for uh, combating COVID-19 and the public health uh, emergency measures. Um, so uh, epidemiology, uh, in this situation of uh, a pandemic is a big data problem, especially um, with respect to the uh, velocity of the, uh, of the data that are generated and, uh, and coming in, um, the velocity, the um, variety uh, from just a tremendous variety of, of sources around the world uh, and, um, and veracity. Um, the, if I would pick one recommendation of all those that the subgroup group has made, um, we would say that it is really uh, there is an urgent need to develop an internationally harmonized specification uh, to enable rapid reporting and integration of epidemiology uh, as much as possible, machine to machine uh, data uh, transmission. Since the uh, last webinar. Um, we have now a standalone um, epidemiology data sharing uh, supporting output. The what was previously in um, a very long section in epidemiology, in the overarching document, uh, much of it has been extracted and moved into the supporting document. <clears throat> and um, there are uh, now I believe six annexes, which are in effect uh, the uh, six papers uh, or manuscripts, so the, 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 uh, the information has been organized into a uh, paper format. Uh, so there is a, um, there is a uh, dedicated web page for the supporting out output from uh, the uh, epidemiology subwork group, which you have uh, the link to. I'll be very happy to entertain any questions uh, at the end uh, when all of uh, the other speakers have uh, completed the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Um, okay, now on to the social sciences and uh, first I'll introduce Irina. Thanks, Natalie. Hello and uh, thank you everyone who contributed to these recommendations and guidelines. Uh, what we wanted to stress uh, is that uh, social science data is essential to the work in all other research domains and uh, in important itself for understanding and managing social, behavioral, and economic aspects of pandemic. And um, it really helps to avoid increasing health and social disparities due to COVID-19 and other health emergencies. Uh, we also wanted to provide some uh, recommendations and guidelines how researchers could correctly plan, collect, handle, share their data, so that this data would really benefit uh, scientists around the world. And uh, we feel like uh, other domains could learn from social sciences how we handle uh, personal data. And uh, what, was what was also very exciting 
for us that we've learned a lot from other domains when we were working on these guidelines, sir. So we've gained a lot from other subgroups, sir. And uh, my colleague uh, from South Africa suggested this uh, ni nice metaphor about Ubuntu philosophy. I probably won't be able to pronounce it well I in Zulu, but the idea is that uh, individual human dignity derives from a group a person belongs to. So what we wanted to stress uh, this community aspect uh, and also how we could uh, look into relations of personal and community aspect in handling social data. And I'll hand it over to my colleague, Amy Pienter, who is a co-moderator to continue with some specific recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Arena. Um, that was a really good setup for a lot of the work that the group did on um, really two uh, distinct topics that I want to um, provide a summary of here. Um, so, Arena talked about the importance of the social sciences of um, bringing to bear the broader context where an individual operates on their outcomes. Um, so, that might be um, information about where they're being treated for a disease, it might be where they live, um, it might be the broader uh, geopolitical context where uh, they are seeing education campaigns about how to stay safe. Um, and because of the work that social scientists have done on this, um, many of our recommendations were geared towards uh, the idea of retaining the information about the individual and where they live and where they were treated um, with enough detail so that it might be linked to sources of data about those contexts. Um, and so we have recommendations that are tackling how to store uh, the sensitive data about one's uh, person and location uh, separately but securely, how to manage that data, how to make plans for that data to be used uh, to link to other uh, sources of data. And so if you think about um, what we have heard from our friends in uh, clinical research or in omics or in epidemiology, um, ensuring that when doing studies in those domains, the information that can be used to link individuals to these broader contexts is in our minds, in our minds critical. So many of our recommendations are on that topic. Um, similarly, um, the social sciences have done a, a great deal of work on um, how to on the rep representativeness of our data sets. And again, several of our presenters talked about many of the methodological limitations that are particularly plaguing us um, during COVID-19 because we're uh, collecting data fast and not under optimal conditions so that we can have um, all of the um, ability to generalize to populations, for example. Um, but there are statistical corrections that can be done, but those things require access to measures and data that can be used to make those adjustments. Um, so the other sort of, uh, one of the more unique contributions of the many contributions of our subgroup um, was to tackle that issue head on. So with that, um, I think that gives you a flavor for uh, the social science guidelines. I will turn it back. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Amy, and also Irina for that. Um, now we're going to move to the cross-cutting themes. And I'll just remind you that if you have questions, you can type them in at any point to the, uh, the questions box and we'll come to those at the end. Uh, so now I'm passing over to Tamea for this section. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Timea Bayro uh, from the Digital Repository of Ireland. I'm also one of the co-moderators of uh, the community participation cross-cutting subgroup. Um, first of all, we would like to thank everyone who, who has contributed to, to, this, uh, to this section of the guidelines and recommendation. It's been um, a, truly a group effort and um, it's very much appreciated. Um, just to set the scene, um, we know that many and diverse communities have answered to this uh, to this emergency in numerous ways, and this cross-cutting theme uh, has looked at the 
at the issues related to data management and sharing and collaboration through the lenses of community participation. The main challenges that we have um, identified are connected to um, adopting an open and inclusive and active approach to bridge all these communities and ensure that all inputs and diverse perspectives are considered and widely communicated. And this need um, has, has to be balanced with the requirement to establish uh, transparent and um, appropriate governance uh, to oversee the, the data and its, its management. Overall, we, we realized that these rather generic um, challenges also translate into a more specific one um, and that is the need for for guidelines that would enable these diverse communities and in this case uh, also citizens and citizen scientists to to participate and contribute effectively to this uh, common body body of knowledge in the um, in detail we have looked at uh, two use cases um, so we've looked into the the app development for contact tracing and uh, symptom tracking and also into participatory disaster response strategies to see how these um, how these um, challenges pan out and uh, we have realized that uh, this wider involvement is not only obviously something that is desired but is something that is necessary and needs to be guided from uh, from all sides of the of the of the spectrum so um, we have identified uh, key recommendations and guidelines, um, so recommendations for funders and policymakers and guidelines for, for researchers, um, for, the, for the researchers. We have particularly looked into and have um, encouraged the public and the patient uh, involvement throughout the whole uh, data management uh, life cycle from the research questions to the, to the final um, data sharing use and um, obviously also long term uh, long term preservation for the for on the funders and policymakers side um, we know that there's um, there's been a, a recurrent reference to the balance that needs to be set between the timely testing contact tracing and emergency response on this uh, on this case alongside with individual privacy privacy concerns we've also um, have been really keen on um, recommending um, a focus on a more inclusive and incremental and multidisciplinary approach. So the involvement of all actors um, of different uh, different roles and perspective into the into the data collection um, activities, the participatory response strategies, and also the coordination platforms. So hopefully. Um, these will provide um, guidelines for for both the practitioners who are involved in all these uh, these aspects but as well to to the ones planning and um, coordinating all these um, all these activities so again thank you very much for 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 the for the contributions to this uh, to this section of the of the guidelines and we welcome any questions and further suggestions Thank you, Tamea. Um, okay, now we'll move to the section on indigenous data. And I believe we have Stephanie here to present this. Yes, hello, this is Stephanie Carroll from the University of Arizona. I'm the co-chair of the International Indigenous Data Sovereignty Interest Group. Uh, and we completed this first draft for this round um, of the indigenous data recommendations, which expands on the community participation um, discussion that we just had and we frame our guidelines um, using the care principles for indigenous data governance um, with uh, COVID specific or disaster response specific examples and concerns that span the variety of issues faced by indigenous peoples across the globe um, including items such as data weaponization, um, lack of data that align with denominators of interest to indigenous peoples um, and and so on and so forth um, these guidelines set out the requirements for indigenous design data approaches and standards um, inclusive especially of the rights uh, to indigenous data governance and decision making with the planning and design of indigenous data collection and sharing uh, the guidelines also highlight the inadequacy of personal and individual data privacy protections 
uh, outlining collective data privacy protections that support community controlled data infrastructure um, as essential to ethical indigenous data practices. Um, so we are keen on any input and questions and recommendations that folks have, especially since this is our first stab at this, um, and look forward to interacting further. Thanks so much, Stephanie. And uh, and your group pulled this together for the, the last release, so thanks for that, uh, that extra effort in a short period of time. Um, okay, now we'll move on to the next section, if I can click there, which is legal and ethical, and I believe we have Brian on the line. Uh, yes, hello, uh, this is Brian Pickering from the University of Southampton. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, if you're in Europe, uh, good morning in the States. Um, I'd just like to give a brief overview and a highlight of some of the work that we've been doing. Like everybody else, um, we're very grateful uh, to everybody who contributed. Um, there have been some very lively discussions uh, on the work that we've been doing. Um, I put some contributors at the bottom. This is not an exhaustive list, uh, but these are the people who uh, have been there right from the start. Um, and one of the things which uh, marks us out um, externally is that our role, uh, and there I've listed this in the priorities, uh, was to provide uh, common uh, guidelines uh, and principles around uh, the legal management of data and the legal sharing of data, but also um, the ethical principles uh, which go hand in hand uh, with the legal uh, instruments that we cite um, and particularly if I pick up on what the previous speaker said right at the end of the care principles and um, this idea that really for the community we should be doing the right thing um, uh, <clears throat> so it's important that we support uh, their interests uh, and look for legal um, methods to be able to do that um, internally it was a very challenging uh, time for us not just for the time constraints that everybody suffered, uh, was under, um, but also because the, the legal practitioners uh, were insistent that we should follow their principles and the ethicists were saying, hang on guys, we need to think uh, about this. And so ultimately, um, the guidelines in the document represents a synthesis of both sides. Uh, moving on to the key recommendations, I just wanted to pick out uh, three particular areas. Um, <clears throat> the first one is access. Uh, and so we focus quite a lot on um, how different groups, different disciplines, different data owners might actually share their data, um, both in terms of primary data, but also uh, the secondary use of those data um, and what we need to do to make sure that uh, the access is timely and efficient, but also appropriate in terms of the benefits for the community as well as uh, for the uh, individual data subject. Um, <clears throat> I've highlighted ethical guidelines um, because uh, especially in terms of, in times of uh, public emergency, um, it is important to think uh, of the benefit to the whole community um, and the responsibility across all of the community. And so one of the exciting things in uh, being involved in this initiative is to see the social science and the medical science uh, aspects of what we need to do to ensure um, the successful uh, tackling of this particular emergency. Um, and then finally, um, I highlighted Open COVID Pledge. Um, this is a group of commercial organizations um, who have committed uh, publicly uh, to doing what they can to make uh, data and to support from a technology point of view, the activities going on in a public emergency. So um, this was the final main, the third main uh, strand of what we were talking about, namely that there are data repositories, there are data owners, um, there are trustworthy data repositories that exist in the non-research environment. And we thought it very important to, uh, to highlight that the principles that we've set out, the legal instruments that we refer to, um, would also benefit uh, from policies which would encourage those people sitting on very valuable data to share those data for the common good. 
Um, so that's an overview um, and any questions, any comments, uh, we will um, take on board and respond to as best we can. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brian. And just to note that we um, we see that people have their hands up. So uh, when we get to the end, we will take questions then. And we're also monitoring the questions in the chat. OK, um, so now we'll move on to the last of the cross-cutting themes, which is research software. And we have Hugh. Hello, everybody. Um, OK, so it's been uh, the just at the end of this, I wanted to talk about the research software subgroups contribution here. So this has been a contribution from 43 members. Um, this is mostly composed of individuals from the Research Software Alliance. So I'm very grateful to them for their contributions to this. The research software contribution became identified as a, a cross-cutting activity in terms of the various other various other subgroups said, hang on, this is an activity which 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 just crops up for all of us. So that was the kind of the basis of why this was 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 set up. So in some respect the recommendations and guidelines that we're doing are quite generic but that's because they sort of should be seen in the context of the other different groups, such as, for example, the omics group and so on. The primary goal was very much to highlight the importance of sharing research software alongside the research data it analyzes and provide guidelines and best practices for enabling this. So it was the, the key recognition that, yes, very much this report is sort of focused on the, 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 the data that's being generated, but that, that if you want to analyze that data, you also have to think about the research software and think about the practices which are which 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 are necessary to enable that. At the end of this, we came up with a series of four policy recommendations, and then a sets of guidelines which were aimed uh, at publishers and also for researchers. If it's possible, can I move on to the next slide, please? Oh, thank you very much. So, although you know our report is sort of like that section of the document is I think about seven pages long, I think there was we can summarize in terms of three sort of generic takeaways, and these three takeaways sort of fit into whether you're, it's, it's the policy recommendations or guidelines for researchers or for publishers. The first one is this: is that you should implement best software practices. Writing research software should, you should do more than simply going and reading the docs and understanding the syntax and then saying, yeah, I'll just get on and, and just start writing software. There are good practices that are out there in terms of release early, develop iteratively, work with other people and so on, test, all of these things are, they're, they're not hard to learn, but you should learn them. And that makes what you're doing much more efficient in terms of the development of the software that's there. The second point is this, is that you, in terms of developing your software and doing those best practices, you should also see that in terms of making, if you are releasing your software to, try and improve the software and make it improve it on an iterative basis correspondingly when you're getting to the point where you're saying i've done a chunk of analysis i.e typically for a paper you should make the software that you've that you've written to enable that you need to make that available all right and in particular that's about depositing the software in a resource such as zenodo or figshare and making getting a DOI for that, all right? So that people can then go and check the software and A, see is it reproducible and see if they can build on that, all right? So that's another sort of key takeaway that's there. The final point is this, is to 
the the other the final takeaway is to say publish the software in other words give credit to the software developers in general so again once you've had that doi for that suite of software that you've developed and just also to stress we're very very wide in terms of our definition of what we mean by software software can mean the the typical images are saying oh yeah it's thousands of lines of code written in java it's not just that software can be macros that are written in an excel spreadsheet all right if your if your spreadsheet is being written using macros you should be doing the same thing for for that as well all right so think about that as 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 broad a chart as possible now publishing your software means not only publishing it in like a specialist software journal, but also in terms of saying, here's my paper, which is doing some analysis of data, and here's also where I have the link to the software, which is again published as a first class object, first class research object that's put there in the, the bibliography. We have the sets of policy recommendations to match that, which match that, but you'll see echoes of those three takeaways occurring in the guidelines also for researchers and for publishers. So in terms of policy recommendations, it's about support the development and maintenance of critical research software. You've got to support the development of research software and also its maintenance. Second point is to encourage research software to be available under a, 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 as a, an open source license and at the very least require it to be available. Then you encourage the research community's ability to apply best practices for research software. And that includes providing the training in software development so that people can be as efficient and effective as possible in developing their research software. And then finally, we support the recognition, the absolutely crucial role that software plays in achieving research outcomes. So like the others, I'm happy to, to, to field any questions at the end of this session. Great, thanks very much, Hugh. Um, and then um, now we have one last slide on, uh, on an additional output that um, is recently available on the RDA pages, and I'll introduce Claire again to speak to this. Uh, good morning and afternoon again, everybody. Um, the uh, Zotero uh, Reference Manager, uh, open source, uh, free open source uh, software, has been used by the subwork groups uh, to support their work in uh, collecting and annotating resources and references. Um, there are 88 uh, members of the uh, library uh, over the uh, past number of weeks, and we, we're up to now nine, 920-something uh, references in the library. That library has developed to a point where we believe that it uh, would be useful not only in support of the, uh, of the work group, uh, but it would be of use to other uh, researchers also. And so there's been an effort over the last couple of weeks to uh, tidy it up, uh, do some housekeeping. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, give a really huge shout out to Anna uh, Vigastuti, Meg Campman, Meg, Megan Underwood, and Mary Romancia, uh, who have uh, really done a tremendous job in helping uh, uh, clean up the, uh, the library. Uh, with the result that that library as of uh, uh, this uh, week is now public and uh, you have the link there uh, for any any member of the wider public can go and uh, view this uh, library now and uh, there is a supporting it has now become a supporting output and so it has its own uh, output page uh, where you can also go and find um, uh, a PDF file, which is a description of, of the library. Uh, but right on right on the page, you can you can uh, click on the link to get to the library itself. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. Okay, so um, where does that uh, take us to today? Um, if you go to the web page for the group, you will see that all five releases are available. Uh, so you can see them there and, and the latest one as well. And then you can also get the links to the Zotero. 
output. Um, now we're in the process of incorporating the feedback. So there was a 10 day community comment period that closed yesterday. We're taking all the feedback that has come in through the, the website. Um, some of them have come in through email and uh, doing our very best to address the issues that were raised. Um, and then also in tandem with this, although uh, we don't expect it to be released at the same time, we're also working on different tools to help navigate the document. So we understand that the document is quite large um, and the expectation is that uh, most people going to this document will be looking for responses to particular areas or areas of research um, or some of the cross-cutting themes. So uh, we're working on uh, various things navigation tool, infographics, uh, possibly a mind map that will assist in navigating this document and bring people to the area that they're searching for in a more efficient way. And then we're also working on dissemination of the document, getting it out there as widely as possible. So any kind of assistance is welcome in this area if you have groups, um, networks, um, professional networks, et cetera, that you can share this with, please do. Uh, and just to give you a quick sense of how those different aspects fall on the timeline, um, we intend to send the final document, so that is the document with the feedback incorporated, to the RDA governance for their endorsement. Uh, that's on Monday upcoming. Uh, they have some time to work through that and provide feedback, which then we will also work to incorporate uh, into the document. And when I say we, I mean all of the people that are um, that have been working on this from all of the different groups. It's really a, a tremendous, um, complex interwoven group effort. Uh, and then the plan is to release the final endorsed document on the 30th of June. And I'll pass over for this slide um, to talk about um, further aspects of outreach and dissemination to Hillary. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, hello, I'm Hilary Hanahoe. I'm the Secretary General of the Research Data Alliance, and I just wanted to um, tell you two things before I talk about the outreach and dissemination. Um, those of you who aren't very, very familiar with RDA may wonder what some of the processes and the terminology that we refer to. So you heard supporting outputs and recommendations, and I'm conscious that perhaps um, you don't it may not be very clear what that means. In any case, uh, the COVID-19 overarching guidelines that you have heard about today um, and the document that we are being pointed to and the document that on the 30th of June we will release finally are what we in, in the Research Data Alliance call recommendations or flagship outputs. And um, actually some of those go on to be standards. I'm not sure if this particular document will, but some of our outputs, we have about 40 of them. We also have what we call supporting outputs, and they are also generated by the community in the exact same way as this uh, particular uh, massive piece of work has been done, but uh, they have a slightly different procedure. They go out for community comment and we receive feedback from them as well, like the, the recommendations. Uh, this particular document will go through a, a, a fast track uh, endorsement procedure with our organisational members, our council and our technical advisory board. Yes. So in, to all effect and purposes, it, when it becomes to the 30th of June and we do, it's endorsed, um, it has gone through the same process as all of our uh, outputs recommendations do. I just wanted to point that out because I do realise it's not always clear to everybody. So when we get to the 30th of June, what are we going to do? Uh, so, so far in the last 10 days, we have done some um, focused, if you like, dissemination and uh, awareness raising of the document, but that was mainly to receive requests for comment and feedback on it. So, uh, obviously, the objective of the phase from the 30th of June onwards will be wide dissemination and impact assessment also to understand is the document actionable and helpful and meaningful. Um, there will be, in addition to a press release, the executive summary and the actual overarching long document itself, the catalogue that uh, Claire kindly uh, presented to us. There will also be some toolkits for stakeholders created, so different uh, PowerPoints and fact sheets extracting some of the information for specific stakeholders, so uh, for policy makers, uh, funders, for publishers, for researchers. And we will progressively 
create those from the 30th of June. We will obviously have um, dedicated press campaigns and social media and outreach to our own community and beyond. We've already received a series of different invitations for events and panels and webinars um, to present the guidelines or different aspects of them. Um, as we are an international organisation, we are investigating the possibility with the Secretariat and the resources that we have to be able to profile some of the members that have contributed to uh, the document and make it, if you like, more local or regional, give a local or regional flavour, perhaps in the form of interviews and different uh, paper and uh, video interviews. Um, so if also, obviously, there will be a series of targeted communications to a contact database that we have that I will uh, generate. But if you have events or um, activities to propose or to invite us to uh, ensure we, there's an expert to present these guidelines, if you are interested, please uh, send a, uh, an email uh, to me and I will forward it to the uh, appropriate uh, colleague either inside the group of uh, co-chairs and moderators or group contributors or to the secretariat. Uh, who deals with the dissemination and outreach. I'll close on my final point, which I've said many, many times, but I think it's important that I say on behalf of the community the importance uh, of this work that has been done. Uh, the immensity uh, of the work that I have never, ever seen in my life, and I've been involved in RDA since the beginning, not in this role, but in other roles, and I've never seen, I've seen some amazing work in RDA, I've never seen uh, such a, a movement of the uh, of the community in a way in this way, and I'm very grateful. I'm also very grateful for those of you who have taken time to comment and to provide feedback and constructive criticism, which we have received and which we need. And I would ask you not to stop doing that, even though the uh, the request for comments period is closed. But we are an open, transparent organisation, and we wish to take on board any comments that we can, and it's useful to receive them. Um, in any way. I'd like to remind you again once, because I don't think anyone has ever said it, this is a completely volunteer effort. This was completely organised and managed by volunteers from the first to the last. I think there are only two of us uh, who, well, the Secretariat is funded and I am funded, but I actually had very little to do with this. So I think it's a, an immense I'm, it's a very unique contribution to this particular moment, but also I hope to, uh, you know, public emergency health uh, situations in the future. But I would remind you that it is completely volunteer, and I thank everybody who gave a little or a very great deal of their time to generate this very important output for the community and for society at large. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hilary. Um, okay, so that brings us to the end of what we're presenting to you. We have a few minutes to take uh, questions. Some of them have come in through the, the question function. So I'll, um, I'll read some of these out. And uh, there is about 18 of us that are either chairs or moderators of the group on this call. So I will just ask people to self-designate and respond to them <laughs> if it comes in. Um, so... Um, I think this one was directed at the research software group. Um, what about making it citable? There does not seem to be much of an awareness in the scholarly community to cite and give due credit to software development efforts. So I don't know if you or someone else would like to respond to that. Hi, Natalie. Sorry, I uh, didn't <laughs> finding the mute button. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Um, in in our section in the in the report um there there I mean that that's been a really really key point that we've been we've been we've we've made again and again um research software developers need credit for 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 the work that they've been doing so uh in particular uh if we look at the you know our our guidelines for for publishers uh we're making this point that you have you have software articles which is which is which is which is one thing and that's very very useful but also for 
you know, pieces of research software that are included as pieces of analysis that they should never be. Um, you never again should have that situation where it's it's like oh yeah here's the thing which is put into the footnotes somewhere and it's in a URL which is which will disappear tomorrow. No, you make sure that it's it's the software is is uploaded onto a site like Zenodo or Figshare. You have a DOI for it and you put that DOI in the bibliography. All right, so that so that the people who are developing it are getting credit are getting credit for that. It, so there's there's that credit element, but also the persistence in terms of software that if we think of this as sort of saying, okay, we have released versions and that they are they are deposited in, in repositories which have got long-term storage in mind. So that again people can go back and look at that release version and say, oh yeah, okay, I can I can look at that, I can judge it, I can can I actually reproduce the, the results and then build on that. That's in conjunction also with the kind of activities of sort of rapid release, which is happening using tools such as, as Git or Subversion and so on, which is there to to rapidly develop software. Uh, so I don't know if that's that's uh, uh, the, that was the the point that they they wanted to cover. If I if I haven't answered that the, the question properly, can the person who asked it shout at me uh, accordingly? I should have specified that was Joe Haveman. Usually, I, I call out the names of the people. So. Oh yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah Joe. Yeah. If, if I got if Joe, if I've if I've not answered that right, please, 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 please let me know. All right. Thanks for that, Hugh. Um, okay. So there are a number of other questions. Some of them are being answered directly. Uh, so bear with me while I go through. Um, Emmanuel Levesque has asked, can I subscribe somewhere? Uh, provide my email address to receive the next version of the guidelines or recommendations. Um, I think your best way is to sign up to um, RDA. You could just just join as a member, Hillary. If you wanted to say anything else to that, you could. But um, that way, you'll get all of the communications. Are a member um, already? I will add. Uh, then join the group. Um, if not, and you don't want to become a member, you uh, just keep an eye on the uh, website or send an email to me and we'll make sure you get the final version. Thanks, Hilary. Um, uh, we have a thank you <laughs> from Nicola Dintzer. He says, um, cooperation around the topic, the effort of everyone. It's a site for sore eyes in the current context. Many thanks to you and everyone else. Well, right back you, at you and everybody else that uh, is joining this and interested in, in contributing in some way. Um, okay. Uh, so Catherine McNeil has asked if we share uh, the guidelines and recommendations to solicit further feedback, where should people share comments in this phase? Well, the, the, the phase for comments was open um, for a period and now it, it's closed as of Monday. So um, because we, you know, we have to at some point stop things to finalize the document, but uh, I anticipate there will be a longer life in uh, these guidelines in, in some capacity. We're developing other bits and pieces and supporting outputs. So I think um, you could you could send feedback to Hillary Hanahoe. I hope that's okay for me to say, Hillary, if you look back at slide 18 in the slide deck, which is available online um, or will be available shortly, you can see her email address there. Um, and then um, I just wanted to say, if Robert Terry is still on the call, um, I see what you've uh, sent in here, and it's very helpful. We'll make sure that it gets into the right um, the right inboxes. There's been one response to, but um, your your statement was a little bit longer than a question that we could answer online in this moment. So we'll pass it on that way. Um, uh, I've had three questions about whether there is a certificate of attendance for the webinar, which is, I don't think, something that we have done in the past. Hillary, would you be able to speak to that? Very quickly, we, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, if you please send an email to, I'll write it in the chat, and inquiries at, uh, we can facilitate that, but we don't, uh, we, we can do them on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so it's a... Different email than the one you saw. Yeah, I've replied individually, given them my oh, email. Yeah. Inquiries okay. at 4D. Like, Thank you. Good. Should we get off? Oh. We're just in. 
Um, hi, Kristen. Did you want to um, make a comment? No. Okay. Um, did any of the other organizers or panelists want to add anything at this point? Okay, well, uh, thank you very speaking. much. Oh. Can I just hi, say hi, one, Anne. one, one thing? It, it, it's about the, uh, the longer question um, by Robert. Uh, and uh, it's about the recognition and being fair uh, in the classical term um, to, to the people who generated the data. And I just want to mention yeah. that if it's still there, that there is um, an interest group in RDA called Shark Sharing Rewards and Credit that is addressing not specifically for clinical data but generally uh, how to uh, recognize the contribution of people uh, sharing their data uh, both in the evaluation of research and through different mechanisms. So this group has not yet uh, issued recommendations but that's exactly one of the points. Uh, this group is working on and maybe it would be interested to join. Thank you, Anne. Anyone else? Okay, then I think we will uh, draw this webinar to a close. So thank you so much for all of the presenters, for everyone who joined um, on the Ready to Answer questions and to all of you. Uh, that have listened and joined us on this webinar today. Please do share these guidelines and recommendations uh, as widely as you can. Um, someone asked, can we share these with colleagues? Yes, please get them out there as much as possible. And, um, and we'll all work on this together. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.